Dante here. I put a verb mm -hmm. for synonym. I put unwilling, and for antonym, I put. Uh, actually, I didn't put anything fancy. You didn't get a chance to do antonym. No. Date you need to write it down. 
April 23, 1564, his birthday. He was born in Stratford-on-Avon to John and Mary Shakespeare. There is a baptismal registration for Shakespeare, but few other written records exist. He was the third of eight children. For this slide, all you need to write is his birthday. children together, Susanna, Hamden, and Judith. August 1596, Hamden died at the age of 11. The cause of his death is unknown. Shakespeare left his family in 1591 to pursue writing in London. The important date here is 1591 when he left his family to pursue writing in London. That's very important. You need to write down when he left and why he left. In 1592, Shakespeare began developing a reputation as an actor and playwright. That is important for me to write down. As theaters were beginning to grow in popularity, it is probable that Shakespeare began earning a living writing plays, adapting old ones, and working with others on new ones. But this make sure you have in 1592, Shakespeare began his reputation as an actor and playwright. What happened in 
Lord Chamberlain's men. Because it was all out of the Because the Lord had time for Chamberlain's Very good. One is because they were all men. Women were not allowed to act during this time period. Also because Lord Chamberlain was their sponsor. He kind of paid for everything, so they named it after him. Ready? Next slide. Shakespeare is also 
also known to have written around 884 words about all of his works. You don't need to write this. And this is what it reads on his grave. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be ye men that spares these stones, and cursed be ye that moves my bones. These are just three different depictions of Shakespeare, and it just asks which one do you guys prefer, or which one are you most familiar with? Uh, one, 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 one of them. One of them. Right hand. The right hand. Yeah. That one. Yeah, he was dead. And this is just another picture of the globe. Now, what shape were the theaters before Shakespeare? Rectangle. Yes. Elizabethan theater, fun fact. The first Elizabethan theater, the Wooden O, was built in 1576. It was the first time to stage in London. It was built by James Burbage, shaped in the form of a tavern. In 1599, theater torn down, but Shakespeare's company used it to build the Globe Theater. You don't have to be just because it's an event. Some more fun facts about the Globe. <laughs> Round, polygonal building with a roofless courtyard, no artificial light, three stories high, upper levels were for the wealthy. Thank you. The Brownleys paid a penny a piece to stand on the floor in front of the stage. We could hold like 800 people. Large platform stage, back of platform with curtains off inner stage, two door entrance exits on either side of the curtain, small balcony upper stage, elaborate costumes but no props. Young boys played the parts of women because women were not allowed to be actors during this time period. That's good. Wait, so there was a man playing Juliet? Yes. That is so good. Fire and rediscovery, Shakespeare's glow burned down. But its foundation was discovered in 1990. It gave us many clues to the Elizabethan experience, such as hazelnut shells. A replica has since been rebuilt. You can visit it and see a play today. Here's some dramatic terminology. You need to write this down. You need to write down a tragedy. is a narrative about serious and important actions that end unhappily, usually with the death of the main characters. The play is broken up into acts, and the acts are broken up into scenes. A monologue is a long, uninterrupted speech given by one character on stage to everyone. Soliloquy, a long, uninterrupted speech given by one character alone on stage and audible to other characters. And an aside, a short speech given by one character traditionally the other characters cannot hear. You need to be aware of all these terms. So what's happening when you talk to this? They're not necessarily like, I wouldn't say they're just talking to themselves because the audience is still here. But they're just giving information for the audience to hear that the rest of the characters will not be cognizant of. Right, it's, right, all of it is entirety unless you're already aware of it. 
tragedy. I'm sure some of you are already aware of what a tragedy is. <coughs> But monologues, a little bit aside, I don't think that you guys are familiar with that. You definitely need to write that down. Put it into memory. Ms. Bank, do you have another piece?
one first couplet, sonnet so the first, third, and last. Do we have these three definitions? No. One more minute. Somebody else I'm Here's some more. A lot of these you're already familiar with, so you don't need to write these down. We have internal rhyme, words rhyming inside one line, in line rhyme, in line rhyme, words rhyming at the end of consecutive lines, perfect versus slant rhyme. A perfect rhyme would be ball and hall. Ball and bell are slant rhymes. They're not exactly perfect, so that would be slant. Alliteration, the repetition of the same beginning consonant. Assonance, the repetition of the same vowel sound in the middle of words. Consonant, the repetition of the same English consonant. Onomatopoeia, words that are spelled much like how they sound. <coughs> if you're already familiar with the term and the definition, don't write it down, but the ones that you're not familiar with, go ahead and write that down. Are we all aware of what internal rhyme is? Yes. What about inline rhyme? Yeah. Words rhyming at the end of consecutive line? So if I say, I went to the mall, I had a ball. That's inline rhyme. Mall and ball. Uh, perfect versus slant. Are we aware of that? Mm -hmm. Alliteration. I know that we're aware of that. Accidents. Are we aware of this one? Mm -hmm. Consonant. And I know we know onomatopoeia.
Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are we finished with this live? No, yes. no. One more minute. Rising action, your crisis turning point, falling action, big climax resolution. As a matter of fact, we should already be aware of this so that you don't need to write it down. Same thing as plot. So in the beginning, he established a setting, there is a conflict in the background. Then as the rising action develops, there are a series of complications. Then we have the peak of the series of complications as the crisis turning point, falling action, result of turning point, characters walk into deep disaster, and then for the climax resolution denouement, death is made characters, and then the loose parts of the plot are tied up. Tips for understanding Romeo and Juliet, you don't have to write this down just because it's another. Romeo and Juliet is based on Arthur Brooks' long narrative poem, The Tragical History of Romeo and Juliet, and this was written in 1562. The play has a highly moral tone. Disobedience as well as fate leads to the death of two lovers. Motifs in Romeo and Juliet, power of love, violence with passion, the individual versus society, and the inevitability of fate. What does it mean by motifs? Kind of like themes that you'll find within the story. Well, like morals? You could say that. I could say that. So, within the tragedy Romeo and Juliet, we have two families, the Montagues and Capulets, and these are two feuding families. This feud has lasted for years and years, even before Romeo and Juliet get met, and they're just not supposed to be together because of the feud that the family has. On the Montague side, we have Romeo, Lord Montague, Lady Montague, Mercutio, and Folio. <coughs> and then for the Capulets, we have Juliet, Lord Capulet, Lady Capulet, Sybil, and the nurse. So you need to remain cognizant of that. Romeo's a Montague, and Juliet's a Capulet. And this is basically the way that the story begins. A pair of star-crossed lovers, and it goes into this whole block of writing. Uh, and here we have, my only love sprung from my only hate. Too early seen unknown and known too late. That is such a contradiction. And these are just characters from the different renditions of Romeo and Juliet. The one that we may end up watching would be the third one. <laughs> it's old, but it's a very good rendition. Very accurate. So you watch. All right. All right, take out your books. Open to page 724. On 724, it introduces you to the Shakespearean Theater. Once you get your book open, once you get your book open, can I get a volunteer to read the first part? That's the title. Yeah. 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 Yeah.